Could you explain what you were shown about the fourth and fifth dimensions? I was taught that nobody wants to go to the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension is where you're going to go to reincarnate. Right now, our goal should be to return home to source. We are all supposed to save our soul. That's why we're here. What happens to the portion of the past life that doesn't join the new consciousness? What was explained to me is that... Were you shown anything about hell? Yes, I was taught that there is... It's a question that... It's almost like too far out. I don't think anybody's really been given the answer. Thank you for joining me, Marlene. Thank you so much, Melissa, for having me. I am just so grateful to be here. I would love to start by asking you about the beginning of your spiritual journey. I was reading your book about the couple of spiritual experiences that you had before all of this started. Are the, is that something that you would like to share about? Oh, sure. I, I do not consider myself a religious person, so I think it's important to put that out. I was not r raised with religion, but what I did go to Sunday school as a small child, and that was really my foundation in what I would call religion, because I believed in God, I believed in Jesus, I believed in Mother Mary. And then later, as a young adult, I did join a religion. So I, I just want to say that, and it, it just didn't feel right with me, it didn't resonate, so I quit. So I do want to say that that's where my religious beliefs were. But I believed that life continued to exist in the form of spirit. I didn't understand it. I thought it was more of a form of energy, and I didn't understand it. So I've had, a, would you want me to go into the one experience I share about my son? Is that? Sure. If you, yeah, oh, if you're comfortable sharing okay. that. Well, my son, when he was in kindergarten, I had an experience where... I was going to be babysitting my niece that afternoon, and it was a warm August morning, and I asked my husband if he could get the baby car seat out of our call space for me so that I could go running errands with my niece while I was going to watch her that afternoon after I dropped my son off kindergarten. Well, it was a really hot day, and at that time, we did, uh, did not have central air, and so I was going to go upstairs and fold clothes on my bed. And my son was right below me in the front room. And he's he was always a very responsible child. And I, I knew I could trust him just to be on the sofa watching TV. And I left the door open when I was in my room. And I poured my laundry all out on to my bed. And I'm sorting it. And I heard a male voice in my head. And I didn't recognize the voice. It was a beautiful voice. But it said, you have to go vacuum. And I didn't know what this was because I'd never heard a voice in my head before. And I found myself almost disagreeing and countering, going, why would I stop what I'm doing to go vacuum? And the voice just strongly said again, you have to go vacuum. It was almost like my body just took control and I became a backseat driver. And I found myself leaving the bedroom, going down the stairs, and I remember in the back of my head thinking, this is crazy, but I'm stopping what I'm doing. I'm going to go go vacuum, and my vacuum is downstairs on the first floor. Well, as I'm descending the stairs, I notice my five-year-old is no longer watching TV, and the house is really strangely quiet. And as I went to go to the hall where the vacuum is, I started calling him because I didn't know where he had gone, and he didn't respond, and that was very uncharacteristic of him. And then I, as I walked past the hallway to, to the dining room where the car seat was, I saw his head flop down and I ran to him and his lips were deep color purple. And I didn't even have time to panic because it, it was, I just had to, to react. And I ran to my kitchen quickly, got a pair of scissors, cut the straps off. He had sat in the chair and the straps were tight across his neck. When I cut it off, and I took him, I picked him up. He came too. And I was just a basket case. I mean, it's even, it's hard to even share the story actually. But all throughout the day, I would get reactions, you know, of 
it felt like waves were hitting me and I just start crying again because it just was such a, you know, awful situation that I hate to deal with. And I never even thought about the voice that had, you know, said to me, I had to go vacuum was the reason until the next day, the next day when I woke up and I had more of a sound mind, you know, instead of my emotions being, you know, in control of this, you know, because of the situation. When I woke up the next morning, it, I realized, oh, it was that voice that saved, allowed me to save my son's life. So I had that, and that really opened up my my world to to know about spirit. But I also believed in spirit even as a young person. I thought that angels were just an artist's imagination of what an angel would look like if they did exist, like in the paintings. I didn't believe in angels, but I learned that angels are definitely real. Thank you for sharing that story. I can't imagine as a mother, like I can just imagine those waves of emotion that you're talking about hitting you and something like that would just stick with you. Do you have any idea who the voice was? Were you ever told? Later during my experience, I was told it was my master spirit guide. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So we'll get into that. Let's move forward to 2020. What happened during the quarantine? Well, during quarantine, it was like normal life was on hold. And I wanted to understand what happens to us when, when you know, the physical body is done. I, I wanted to understand more about heaven. And so I just started watching podcasts and reading books about it. And this was in the spring of 2020. I just was guided, I felt, then to take this spiritual class by Julie Ryan. And then I took this class and it just opened my world to believing in angels and understanding that life goes on and that our lives now are just temporary, but that our lives are eternal when we do leave this world. So she opened me up to that, and then I became a part of her community, and the community was just amazing. And then when the class ended, I participated in a sound healing with one of the the women who is an alumni of the class as well. And during that sound healing, well, actually that morning, I said a prayer to God and to Archangel Michael, because at that point, this was like two weeks after the class ended. I said a prayer asking God if Archangel Michael could help me to become a medium to help to give people hope and healing to know that their loved ones continue to exist. So I just said this prayer and didn't think anything of it. And then I participated in the sound healing. And what was interesting is that the sound healer, this was her second time doing it online because of the whole COVID thing before she would do them in person. But she, right away, she says, oh, this is interesting. This is the first Archangel Michael is coming through one of my sessions. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And she goes, oh, he's not wearing the warrior clothing. So many of you see him in. She goes, he's wearing a beautiful white robe. And then he said a message and it was very general. And I was thinking, oh, that's interesting because I envisioned him in a white robe because I didn't know that much about him at the time. I didn't know he was seen in warrior clothing, but I didn't put it together. I just thought that, you know, later on, I realized there was that synchronicity of him being seen in a white robe. But then what had happened is about a month later, I had an appointment with a woman who became my spiritual mentor. And she had said that Yahshua and Archangel Michael had appeared. And they had said that if I want to do this, I have to believe I can do this. And so that I didn't know where this was going to go. But then after that, I ended up just using a pendulum and I I can't explain. It just was something that I picked up. And actually, I didn't use a pendulum. I used a necklace because I felt like I had saw someone using a pendulum online. And then one day I thought it was random. I printed out a alphabet chart and I used a necklace. And uh, a loved one of mine came through who had passed like 20 years ago, a dear friend. And I started communicating with her and then she opened the door for me to communicate to my spirit guides and then my spirit guides opened the door to communicate with Archangel Michael. And then I ended up communicating with the collective of source energy spirits and they taught me all about heaven and reincarnation and 
they said the reason we are here is solely for soul growth. Okay, very interesting. I would love to ask you about your communication method because I've used a pendulum before. Actually, like you, it, it was a necklace that just worked really well, but you can only get a yes and no answer according to the method that I used, but you're saying that you used an alphabet chart. So how does that work? Do you like what you're hearing on this podcast? For just $10 a month, you can join Love Car Life Academy, where you'll have access to our exclusive community chat and our weekly live streams, where we answer your most pressing questions and deep dive into your spiritual practice. You don't have to be alone on this journey. Come join us. We would love to have you. I had never seen it before. I didn't know it existed like you. And so he gave a screenshot of one of the alphabet charts and I took a screenshot and so I actually, when he showed that, I took a screenshot of it and printed it out. And I was like, well, what am I going to do with this? Because I didn't know anything about a pendulum and I filed it away with some books. And then just one day, randomly, I'd say about a month after I printed out that chart, I just felt like I was actually getting ready to go to the grocery store. And I just felt like, I'm going to try with a necklace using that chart. There was no rhyme or reason to it. And that's when my friend came through and it was very obvious. It was my dear friend who came through. She's been deceased for about 20 years. Okay. Very interesting. So oh. is it a slow? Oh, go ahead. No, because I was going to say, I really didn't describe the alphabet chart. Oh, yeah, go it, ahead. It's like a half moon. And then there's it's segmented with the alphabet. So then there's an A, a B, a C, it goes all the way to Z. And so when you use the the necklace or the pendulum that I ended up using, it will swing to the letters. Very, very time-consuming process. Mm. And that's actually how I was given all my messages. But what I ended up doing is I recorded every session, and then I would go back and tr type up the transcripts because I couldn't recall all the information they would give me in that time. It was more like a conversation. Mm-hmm. Okay, so did you say it out loud as it was pointing to yes. the different letters? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's when you know you're really communicating with someone because if you're actually spelling out words when you're going through that process, it can't be random. No. Like one time they're talking about the hills in our lives and that they and they, there are challenges and that we're supposed to climb these hills in our lives to create soul growth. But my guide once used the word L-O-K, and I go, I thought that you're only, you know, going to use words that are in my, you know, my vocabulary. And he, and, he, and he said, no, we can use other words now. And I said, well, what language is this? He goes, English. And it turned out the word L-O-K meant small hill. Really? Yes. And I had, of course, no idea. But so they would do things like that from time to time. And it, 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 you could just feel the playful energy. Okay, that's amazing. Okay, so you started out by talking to one of your dear friends, and then they connected you to your guides, you said? She one day told me she was going to introduce me to my spirit guide, and I wasn't that really crazy about that. I was like, I didn't know anything about communicating with a spirit guide. And so I was a little uncomfortable. And she said, oh, no, he's a really nice, he's a really nice spirit guide. So, and at that point, I totally trusted my girlfriend. There was information coming through. I was allowed through her to communicate to family members and things like that. It was, it was a short period of time, but it seemed longer because I was in the house more. So I had more time that I could do things, spend using the chart and the pendulum. So yes, she guided me to communicate with my spirit guide, James, and he started teaching me all about heaven and reincarnation and such. And then, and he had told me that the reason I was, or actually my girlfriend had said it too, that the reason I was allowed to have this experience was because of Archangel Michael. And I didn't know anything about him at this time. And so all they have to do is pray for it. And if they're sincere and genuine about what they want, they said that they can have it through prayer, that prayer is so powerful. Okay, could you share with us what Archangel Michael, was it Archangel Michael that showed you about heaven? Yes. So, okay. Well, actually, my spirit guide had told me, this was someone who I communicated later, the Norseman told me that heaven is sound energy. 
So I was told that heaven is sound energy and that there are not only dimensions in heaven, which I think everybody knows about that, but there's dimensions in our soul. And I'm what was explained to me is that my guide, James, actually taught me but about reincarnation. I think this is really important for people to understand. Reincarnation, what it is, is it's a chance for us to create a loving soul because that's the reason we're here. We're here for solely for soul growth. And it was explained to me that what happens is that our, our past lives, they're all one with us. Our past, and they don't call them past lives, they call them previous experiences. And so what happens is that if um, a past life did something that say we would not do in our lifetime, our soul learns from contrast. So they will learn from contrast not to do that again, but it can create lower energy in our soul. So when, what ends up happening is that the soul can choose to reincarnate, but you and I would not reincarnate because as they explained it to me is that when a soul chooses to reincarnate, a part of every single past life goes into a brand new consciousness. And this brand new consciousness is what, be, you know, chooses a, a, an infant's body and then will be born to a family that they was chosen. This new consciousness is for this one with our soul because we are a copulation of every single previous experience in our soul. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very interesting. So a portion of each previous experience forms a new consciousness. What happens right. to the portion of the previous experience or the past life that doesn't join okay. the new consciousness? What it is, is it's an eternal spirit. So you and I will become eternal spirits in our soul, but you and I as a personality will not reincarnate. What would happen is our soul, if our soul chooses to reincarnate, the soul would then create new consciousness of our soul. And that's why we're, we are one and the same with all our previous experiences. And actually, I was taught that if there's lower energy in our soul, and they said that almost all souls have lower energy from our past lives, and we're to love them, even though maybe they did things in a past life that is not something we would do now, but our soul learned from that, not to do that again. But they transitioned with this lower energy, and we are here, and we can remove that lower energy. We are such powerful creators and with and we can remove that energy because we're they taught me by the power of prayer. The power of prayer is just such an amazing gift. Okay, could you share that with us? How would we remove that negative energy or that lower energy? Sure. They taught me to say a prayer, and I'm more than happy to share it with anyone if they reach out to me. I'd be happy they don't have to buy the book. It's in the book. But what the prayer is about is it's us you know, thanking God for the opportunity to be able to heal our soul. And another thing I was told, nobody can heal another person's soul. Only we can heal our own soul. So no one can do it for us. It's our job to do that. So they had said that if anybody's interested and asks for their help, they will help them. So we would pray to them and ask God, to thank him for the opportunity to remove the lower energy from our soul. And then we would thank our previous experiences for who they are and what they contributed to the soul because we couldn't exist without them. Even the experiences that we wouldn't agree with, they played a role who we are. So we have to send our love and appreciation to them. And then we would ask source to please remove any lower energy that we created as our previous experiences. And then when source removes the energy, we ask that the room that is created in our soul for source to replace it with loving energy. And th they said, I'm to do it for myself as well, that I am to pray for myself to, you know, please forgive me of any 
or choices I made that create lower energy in my soul and then ask source to remove that lower energy and then in the room that's created my soul to replace it with loving energy. And then they also tell me something that was very new to me, that we have simultaneous experiences existing concurrently. And they said, we are also, it's very important that we pray for these simultaneous experiences and ask that that negative energy be removed from our soul as well. So you've shared with us a different perspective on reincarnation, which is very fascinating to me because I've had the feeling for a long time that it's not just as simple as souls going through a progression of lifetimes because outside of this time-bound realm, everything is happening simultaneously anyway, and we're all part of the one source anyway. So it's just always interesting to hear Mm -hmm. like a higher perspective on what's going on. Yes, and everything is... It, it is all existing is the word I would use over happening because it, 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 everything's existing because I was allowed the gift to communicate with some of my past lives. So I know they exist. And they explained to me that everything we do is of record in heaven. They said it's like a movie. So any thought we've had, anything we've done, every single thing we've done in our life um there's it's a record and so that becomes a part of who we are and we're responsible for the energy that we create Mm. would you be comfortable sharing about your past lives or is that private oh no i shared in the book i didn't get a lot of information but they came through because they were the ones who helped me to learn that I have the power to save my soul. And one was, he said that he lived during, trying to think what time it was, he was Hebrew and he was a slave. And his name was Van. And they gave me names because to keep everything straight. So, but, so he was just, I'm trying to think what year that was. I think it was like 45 BC, I apologize. I don't, but I, I would ask them that. And I would ask them if they were loving. And all of the ones that I was allowed to communicate were all loving. And I found out later they were sending masters in my soul, but I didn't know that at the time that I was given the opportunity to communicate with them. So one woman was a Tibetan woman from ancient times. And then it was this other Hebrew slave. And then there was another, there was just a few of them that I communicate with because they were teaching me that I had the power to help heal the soul. So once I figured that out, then I, it wasn't that I was communicating with them in regards to their, their lives. It was more about what needed to be done to help the soul, which was, like I said, about the loving prayer. Okay, I was just going to ask you about that because you mentioned that you learned that you could save your soul, which is interesting because in Christian theology, we're taught that our souls need to be saved but can only be saved through Jesus. You had mentioned that you were shown you could save your own soul, right? Yeah, and and we are all supposed to save our soul. That's why we're here. We are all here to make our soul become a loving soul. So, yeah, first let me ask you, what does that mean? Because people, maybe from a Christian perspective, might have an idea of what it means to save your soul, which in that context, it means to save your soul from the consequences of sin or eternal torment in hell. But in this context, what does it mean? Okay, I appreciate you saying that because that is not my context at all. Saving the soul is that through our I'm going to call them past lives. The spirit world refers to them as previous experiences. The lower energy that's been created in our soul from these previous experiences, we need to remove it. They say it's become stagnant in our soul and they can't remove it. Only we can remove it. That That's the gift we have coming here in the new chosen consciousness in the body is to be able to do that. So, that's what we're here to do is to have our soul become a loving soul. And we can do that by the prayers and asking for it to be removed. 
it's really simple, actually. <laughs> so when you say that we can save our soul by making our soul a loving soul, do we start out as unloving or is it just that we need to grow more in love? Uh, well, what it is, is every experience, as I said before, you're responsible for that energy you created in your lifetime. It comes back with you. So even though we are of loving spirit, we're responsible for the energy we create. So that comes back with us. And our goal is to return home to source. We're all a part of God. We're all oneness. And so that's our goal, to return home to source. We cannot do that when there's any lower energy in our soul. So we need to remove all the lower energy and then we will be able to return home to source. But once we remove our past lives, lower energy, we still have to make loving choices in our lifetime. We'll not carry any lower energy and it's so that we can, won't can hold our soul back from becoming a loving soul. Okay, that is, that's really interesting. So I think I understand the bigger picture here is that we come from loving source, right? But in these lifetimes, we can make choices that lead to a lower energy. And then yes. we need to save our souls by pr prayer to remove that lower energy and make ourselves a purely loving soul so that we can return to source. Which leads me to another question that I would like to ask you, which is, what is your definition of source? Oh, Yes, they actually gave me a definition that I would like to share with you. Source is a collective of loving spirits who previously lived that acquired their vast experiences in love and mastered understanding time and time again. And I actually, I'm reading this because I could not remember those words precisely, but they gave that to me. And I was also told that source is raw energy. So source is raw energy and then sources all the loving spirits that have returned home because we're all a part of source but because of law of attraction we can't go back to source until we remove all the lower energy from our soul i love that definition and i have heard that from other people as well are you familiar with howard storm i did hear about his near-death experience but i'm i'm interested in, what you're saying that he said about because i remember it was an amazing near-death experience and he actually had a very negative near-death experience mm -hmm. but it became loving once he asked for jesus to help him yeah exactly so he was shown heaven in a lot of detail and one of the things that he saw is that source is a collection of beings it's not just one being oh. and he saw the same thing that you're describing that we're on an evolutionary journey to source and we get higher and higher levels of heaven are available for us to progress through. And then what we call God in religion is actually a group of beings who are as like highly developed as they can be. And he also said that those beings are creating the universe through music, which is why it's oh, very interesting that you said wow. that heaven is sound energy. Wow. Yeah, I was just given bits and pieces, but it all comes together, you know, because I was using a pendulum. So it was, and I have to say, I, I worked for, in a, for a law firm for 15 years, and that's what I did. So in transcription, so it was like something I was comfortable with to do because initially when I first had my experience, I just thought I'm having this loving experience and communicate with my friend. But then she said, you have to journal, journal, journal. And when I was started to communicate them with my spirit guide, that's when I recorded it because I could not recall what was, I mean, I was given so much information. So I have all these recordings. Yes. So back to the question about source. I don't really know how to word this question or whether or not there's an answer to it, but I'm just really curious if Source is a group of beings who evolved to where they are now. At one point, they were probably at our level. Was Is there a Source that's beyond them as well? Or, you know, what was out there that they were working towards? Well, as I understand it, Source is raw energy, and that, so we are a creation of that raw energy, but source is all loving. 
and we are to return to source. So to return to source, we have to become all loving because of the universal law of attraction. But Mm -hmm. in terms of what's out there beyond source, I understand what you're saying, but Mm -hmm. this was just what I was taught. I was told I was having my experience to, to teach about soul growth. And because it was about soul growth, they taught me about reincarnation. Mm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's a question that it's like, it's almost like too far out. I don't think anybody's really been given the answer to that. But source is raw energy. And it is interesting because I have heard there was a podcast of a woman who had a near-death experience that I've heard about that this woman died in a young woman died in a reef. And then when she went to heaven, she was pleading to, to come back, you know, and not die because she felt she hadn't achieved enough. But she said, Jesus was there. And then she said, the sense of God was there. It was like consciousness just came there. So God is just the consciousness, but all the loving beings are a part of that consciousness. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my interpretation, you know, of source energy. Right. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. So what was the most surprising information that you received? One of the most surprising messages was about forgiveness is equivalent to, to hate. And I was very surprised that someone who is unforgiving, they're creating the same low energy as hate. And I I didn't understand that, but then it was explained to me how when someone is not forgiving someone, they're actually allowing the person they're not forgiving to hold their emotions in bondage, the person who's being unforgiving. And what that does is it doesn't allow the soul to go forward and create soul growth. So I was very surprised to learn that. And I I break that down and explain because when you forgive someone, that doesn't mean you condone their behavior. It it does it, but it just means that you can move forward from it. it. You don't accept what they've done, but you can move forward and continue on with your life. Okay. Yeah, that does make sense. One other question that I wanted to ask you is, could you explain what you were shown about the fourth and fifth dimensions? Yes, that was interesting. I was taught that nobody wants to go to the fourth dimension. I was told that the fourth dimension shares the same energy with the third dimension. And we all know, I don't even watch the news anymore, but we all know what's going on in the news that if the fourth dimension shares that same energy, that's not a place that we want to go to. So the fourth dimension, I was taught that we can bypass it in the fifth dimension now. And we can do that just by making loving choices. It's all about just making choices of love, what Jesus taught us. If we follow Jesus' example to, to make loving choices, then we become a loving soul. Were you shown what the difference between third and fourth is? No, they said they they share the same energy. So they said that when someone transitions and goes to the fourth dimension, they're going to, and it reminded me, you talked about, what was his name, Howard Storm? Yes. Saying that now, and where he went, that was probably the fourth dimension because it was that lower energy that he was experiencing. But my guides were saying, you don't want to go there. And if you live in the fifth dimension now, making loving choices, you can bypass that. That's interesting because of all the talk about moving to 5D. And so there, it is like completely skipping 4D if we're going from 3D straight to 5D. And I think that's something a lot of people wonder about. Yes. Well, yeah, they clearly said no one wants to go to the fourth dimension. And the fourth dimension is where you're going to go to reincarnate. Right now, our goal should be to return home to source. Human beings have been on the planet Earth for maybe like 300,000 years. And every person living today, we're such special beings because we were, we, they've entrusted us 
to have our souls become loving souls so that we can return home to source energy. So we've had all these experiences and it's time to return home. So we don't need to go to the fourth dimension anymore. We're to stop this cycle of this karma and choose to live what I understand is our dharma, to live in creation of love right now. Very interesting. Were you shown anything about hell? Since we're talking about Howard Storm and you mentioned that he probably went to the fourth dimension, do you think that's where the hellish experiences happen? Yes, I was taught that there is no such thing as hell, but I was taught that we create our own heaven. So if someone believes in hell and carries low energy with them, they're going to create, their heaven is going to be a creation of hell. So, because our heaven is what we choose to create it to be. And Howard, if I do recall, he really wasn't in a loving place at that time when he transitioned to the fourth dimension. And right. I, I would believe it was the fourth dimension. Yes. And so that's what I, how I, I view it. Interesting. So you were shown something about Jesus going to India. Could you share that? Yes. They would give me just little snippets and they just one day said, Jesus went to India. And I was I didn't know anything about, well, that Jesus had any association with India at the time I was given this message, but then they know that I would research things. And then when I did, it turns out there's several books out there that talk about that there is, um, I think, a Tibetan monastery, or there's places that they have ancient scrolls that talk about Jesus having gone to India, and that he was learning under different monks, I think Buddhism, but they said it wasn't that they were just teaching him, he was teaching himself too, that he was connecting to source on his own, but that he, it, that he was actually preaching there before he chose to come back and preach in his homeland. That's what these books, the gist of it has said. Are you familiar with Dolores Cannon? Very much so. In fact, in my book, when I first communicated with my girlfriend, I asked her, I said, do you have any authors you can recommend? And she said Dolores Cannon. Mm -hmm. And actually, I know that I read the book, Jesus and the Essenes. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about. Well, there's two of them, Jesus and the Essenes, and then they walked with Jesus. She regresses a couple of people who lived during Jesus's lifetime, his ministry, and they shared exactly what you just said, that he oh, went wow. to the East, not just India, but I think Egypt and maybe one more place. And he went to the mystery schools in all those places and was learning like the most advanced spiritual techniques. I think she even said that he was teaching while he was there, and that's where he actually started his ministry, and then he ended up coming back to Israel. Well, and it, it's interesting because once I did start looking into that with books being out there that say that Jesus did go to India, it it turned out that people were saying that Joseph of Arathema, I mm -hmm. hope I'm saying it correctly, was his uncle yeah. and, he, and that he was a well-respected merchant. So he was wealthy, but he had the means of caravans and ships that you know, Yash, yes, sorry, I said, uh, Yeshua, you know, I mm -hmm. normally call, I go back and forth with Jesus. I prefer to call him by his Hebrew name, Yashua, but I, out of respect to everybody else, I say Jesus, but that he would go with him on these different countries and that he would learn, you know, from, from these different countries. So he had the means of traveling is what I'm trying to get at, if mm -hmm. what these people are sharing have said. And I also think it's really interesting because Joseph of Arathema was the one who went and asked Pontius Pilate for Jesus's body. So, and he gave it, to, it gave him Jesus's body. So it makes sense he was relative is my point. Right. Yeah, you know? I was going to ask you, sorry to cut you off, is there any evidence outside of Dolores Cannon's book that he was Jesus' Jesus's uncle? 
That I don't know because I just would have my messages come from them and I really didn't have an opportunity to mm-hmm. dive into because, you know, like when they said Jesus went to India, I would kind of look into that. But just the fact that they write about that, it just makes logical sense that it does. he would be a relative because, and he was well-respected, you know, so him being a, a wealthy merchant makes sense that Pontius Pilate would give him the body, you know, he wouldn't just give him Jesus's body. I don't think if he wasn't a relative, but I, I'm just kind of, that's my mindset. On it. All right. Well, Marlene, thank you so much for being willing to have this conversation. And would you like to share with the viewers where they can find you? Yes, I have a website and it's called lightworkermedium.com. But again, I want to share with people when I use the word medium, In my book, I explain that I'm taught that we're all mediums and that we all communicate with spirit. And although I've put away the pendulum, now I communicate, but it's more like loving thoughts. I do it through meditation. It's more of a feeling. So I just want people to not think I'm, when I have the title medium in my website, that I'm someone who would be bringing through other people's loved ones or things like that. I am a light worker medium in the sense that I communicated with loving spirits and they taught me all about heaven and reincarnation. Wonderful. I will have your links in the show notes for people to check out. Thank you so much, Marlene. I've really enjoyed this. Oh, thank you, Melissa. I really appreciate the opportunity you've given me because I never intended to be doing podcasts or I've always been a very private person, but I was told to share. So i that's what I'm doing, sharing the messages. Well, thank you for being willing to put yourself out there. I know it's not easy. No, it, it's not. And even doing the book, when they told me, they said there will be a book. And I was like, <laughs> I have no idea about how to do a book, but it's done now. And it's called Lost Soul, How I Became a Lightworker Medium. But it's not just about me. It's all about all the lessons I was taught about heaven and reincarnation. Mm-hmm. And they, they've said it's for other people to learn from. They were very clear about that. That's why I'm supposed to be sharing sharing the messages. Yeah, there's a lot of information in the book, so it's definitely worth the read. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching and listening. Your views, likes, comments, and shares truly make the biggest difference in supporting this channel. Don't forget to check the show notes for all the links to today's guest, as well as my links. You'll find me on social media at Love Cover Life, my website, lovecoverlife.com, and the Be A Guest link for anybody who would like to be a guest on the channel. I have great news. Love Cover Life podcast is coming available on audio podcasts. You can find it wherever you listen to your audio podcasts.